guys if I'm going to take this, so I'm going to take this mask off. I don't want y'all to miss nothing. Okay? All right. I, today I'm going to talk to you on the subject, like I said, it's so. always, always too soon to quit. Here's what happened to you and I, though. Every Christian, every Christian like this, there came a time in our life when we were presented with the Word of God, and we made a choice. Do I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, or do I not accept Jesus Christ as my Savior? And there came that day in our life when those of us that are saved, we made that decision that we're going to accept Christ. Some of you, it was easy to make. Some of you may have made it as a child, or made it as a young person. But as time went on, it got harder and harder. And so you had to struggle, had to struggle through all the sins that lay in the past and all the doubt of the future. And you had to struggle with that. But there came a time when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. From that time until the Lord comes back. From that time until the day death calls you home. We're involved in work. <laughs> There's no easy way about it. Being a Christian is work. God expects us to work. So on this Labor Day, if you will turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Let's start right there. That's a good place to start. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58. Paul said to those Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now listen to this last part. For so much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said to the Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians 3.13, He said this, But ye, brother, be not weary in well-doing. He said to the Galatians in 6, 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, but in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So here we are at Labor Day. Labor Day 2020. How in the world, what is Labor Day? When did it start? Well, actually it started in 1882. A man named Peter McGuire. He was a carpenter in the state of New York that belonged to a local union. And he got the, little, got the town that he lived in there in the state of uh, New York to celebrate that. Man, that thing took off like wildfire. You know why? Because he had celebrated the common man. It was not celebrating some celebrity's birthday or some great politician's birthday. It was celebrating the average person, the old working Joe that works five, six days a week, seven days a week. And 12 years later, in 1894, President of Cleveland declared it to be a national holiday the first Monday of September every, every year. A lot of the work you did and will do in your lifetime amounted to absolutely nothing. Now think about that just a minute. A lot of the work you did has absolutely, it amounted to absolutely nothing. You'd be just as well off to stay at the house. But a lot of days in my life when that was through the end business, that's the way it goes. But everything I've ever done for God, every word I've ever spoken, every vision I ever made. It's not in vain. Amen. God, now I might self-evaluate and say, well, I don't see any results. Well, I need that. see, that really ain't my problem. I don't need to be involved in that because God said it will never go in vain. So, here we are. We're saved, folks. We're on the way to heaven. And we never do get tired of doing good. Do we? Well, it's kind of like this. I'm involved in a flower garden in that I look at. 
Yvonne does all the work. But early in the spring, she's excited to get out there and start, and I'm excited to get out there and look at it. But by August, everything kind of changes. There's weariness on her part, and it don't look as good as it did start on my part. Sunday school teachers, you'll get worried and well do it. Vacation Bible school, you get worried and well do it. Those of you that, uh, that, that take care of the nursery, do anything in church, the old flesh and blood is going to get tired. Doesn't matter if you play the piano, if you teach, doesn't matter. The old flesh and blood is just going to get tired. But now let's just ask ourselves this question. Why do we get weary in the Lord's work? I think there's several reasons. First of all, there's a physical reasons in that we just get tired. As you get older, you get tired earlier. Now, most of you here don't believe that, but, uh, but as you get older, you just get tired. And now, there is a physical side of us, you see. And in uh, Elijah, in 1 Kings, Elijah had a busy day. Here's what he did in one day. First of all, he went to the king's court, had it out with him. Then he built an altar. He challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a showdown. So he had to build an altar. Not only that, he had to dig a big creature around to a hold of water, water. If that wasn't enough, he had to kill a bullock. If that wasn't enough, he had to cut that animal up, lay it on the altar, then have a prayer meeting, and God called down fire from heaven and consumed it. Well, you think he'd be on cloud nine. You think he'd be he'd be just shouting from the rooftop. But Jezebel said, Hey, I'll you tell him, by night time he's gonna be like the prophets of Baal. He's gonna be dead. And what does he do? He takes off. You know, when a person gets tired, they don't think right. You know, you're just tired and give out. He was tired, but the next day in 1 Kings chapter 19, the Bible said that he lay down under a tree and he took a nap. And an angel woke him up with something to eat. You see, sometimes we just simply need to rest. We get tired of the Lord's work and, and sometimes we just need to set just a, just a rest a while, rest during the week. It is, uh, I've learned over the years, if I work real hard on Saturday, it's hard to concentrate on Sunday because the physical side of us goes downhill. But then we get tired not only physically, but emotionally. You'll get tired quicker emotionally in church than you will at Walmart. It don't matter if somebody runs over me in a buggy at Walmart. I find a fork lift and run over him. <laughs> but here at church, if somebody says something or does something that's, uh, that's inconsiderate or unkind, man, that's emotional to me. That would just tear me, tear me all, to, all to pieces. Think of the people in Second Thessalonica. These people were discouraged because everybody wasn't doing their part. I mean, tell you, if you get discouraged over that, you may as well get me in. But get ready, you're going to be discouraged now. Here's the way it runs in, in most churches. Not true here, thank God. But in most large churches, in large churches, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Now, that's not true in a small rural church like we are. We probably... 50-50, most of you do everything you can do. I'm proud of you for doing that. But these people at Corinth, they looked around and said, now wait a minute, here I am going visiting, never mind, there goes John over there. He ain't been visiting in six months. And what you do not want to do is start looking around and thinking that you're doing more than somebody else. Here's the thing, of it. you don't know what other folks are doing. Just because you don't see them doing it don't mean they're not doing it. But now there's a physical reason you get tired. There is an emotional reason you get tired. And then there is a spiritual reason we get tired sometimes. Sometimes we just lose touch with God. 
sit in church every Sunday and still lose touch with God. Why? Your minds wonder if you're thinking about everything. No, listen. Don't think about nothing but God when you get in this order. Don't think about God and listen to what what is being what's being said. And, and we get uh, spiritually away away from God. You know, you can have spiritual imbalance just like you can have chemical imbalance. You see, chemical imbalance. When a person gets chemically imbalanced, that affects their health and affects their attitude. And if I get in a backslidden situation, if I start backing up on the Lord, there is a problem on my part, not on the church part. So now, how do we fix it? How do we fix it? First of all, never, never, never quit. Never, never quit. Will Rogers said this, you can't defeat a man or woman that won't stay down. Hey, let the devil wreck you if he wants to. Let him kick you down. But listen, get up and go again. Paul told the, the, the Galatian church, here's what he said. And let us not be worried well doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Paul said, I want you to remember, first of all, the privilege of the Christian life. It is a privilege to serve the Lord. Matthew said this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christians are two things. We are believers and we are behaviors. We are believers and we are behaviors. Now, if we don't behave like we're a believer, we're in trouble with God. There is, there is laid down in the Scripture the protocol that a Christian ought to live by the rules that God has laid down. You see, why do we, why do we work for God? It is not that we want any glory for ourselves, but we want to be in the will of God, reading the Word of God for the glory of God. Everything in our lives got to be for the glory of God. The Bible said that Jesus Himself went about doing good. Every time we do good, it means we're walking in the, in the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Being good in works. Doing things. Doing things. Shows the reality of your faith. But it does something else. It's the only way you can lay up treasures in heaven. Folks, grace not going to lay away no treasures in heaven. It saves your soul. That's the way you were saved. By grace through faith. But grace will not lay you one treasure in heaven. It is all by what we do after we're saved, after we come under God's grace. It is what we do for God. Does God expect me to do something after I'm saved? You better believe He does. Now, everybody differs. God's will for my life was to preach. God's will for Brother Buddy's life was to lead to saving. God's will for a lot of you are the same specials. Y'all ain't got there yet. <laughs> but y'all are working on it. Y'all are working on it. Now then, there's opportunities that come up in your Christian life. Look for opportunities. If you don't look for opportunities, God will present, God will present you with one. Nobody in the Baptist church ought to say, I ain't got a job. There's a job here for everybody. A job for everybody. You may say, I ain't got no talent. And I say to you, you're exactly what God's looking for. Because God can take you and God can get glory from your life. You know, there's a lot of folks in like great places beyond this morning. How many Christians in communist China will like to be sitting right here with a mask on listening to preach? And how many people in hell would give all the world if they could sit in the pew where you're at this morning? And listen to the word and come forward and give the invitation. Matter of fact, I don't think most of them, but none of them would wait for the invitation. They would come forward ahead, ahead of time. But now with that privilege, there's a pearl. That is, there is a danger. There is a danger. Though 
We may be in the Christian church, though we may be in the Lord's work, there's first of all the weariness that I talked about already in the Christian life, being worried in the ministry. And if we're not careful, if my mind and my heart and my intentions, all that I am is not in God's work, here's what will happen. I will get dreary and I will get down and I will get out and I'll come in here looking like I could my face so long I could eat crap out of the bottom of a churn without a spoon. And you know what's going to happen? If I come in here like that, in just a minute I'm going to look out there and all of y'all look like y'all get in the churn with me. Y'all see, we rub off on each other. We rub off on each other. We can never operate business as usual. We can never be satisfied. Well, here we got what we got here. Fifth 35 and Sunday school. We can't be satisfied with that, folks. There's more pews. There's empty pews here. If we had a hundred in Sunday school, we can't be satisfied with that. No, we got to be aggressive in the, in the Lord's work. And remember, Doctor, the greatest joy you have in your life is serving the Lord. If you ever stop making sacrifices and the Lord's work demands sacrifice. We become like that prodigal son we talked about a couple of weeks ago. There he was on the farm working every day, but always a bitter attitude toward his younger brother. Never did see himself as a, as a son of a father. Always saw himself just as a servant. We are servants of God, but we're more than that. We are the sons and daughters of God. So how do I stay unworthy? How do I do that? Remind myself, first of all, that I'm under a great privilege just to be able to serve the Lord. With those disciples, the authorities got them together and they raked them over pretty good. Here's what they said. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we're not careful, we become like the priest that Malachi talked about. They were just going through the motion. They would bring sick animals. You're supposed to be an animal without spot and blemish. They would bring animals with broken legs and animals that was, uh, just at the point of death. Why? Because something that went wrong in their walk with the Lord. None of us are where we will be later on in life. You're always moving this way or that way in the Lord's work. None of us are there. None of us will ever reach perfection. But we can grow in the Lord. So there is a privilege in the pearl. And now the promise is in Galatians. Let us not be worried well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now the word faint, we, the word faint now means I'm going to kill over like I'm dead. But the word faint back then meant to quit. That is that if we don't quit, we're going to reap in the harvest. All the way through the Bible and the New Testament, Jesus and the other, and, and the other writers said this, they always had this illustration illustrating the Christian life as a farmer. So here's a chicken farmer. I can relate to that. We used to have chicken house years ago in the 60s. Feed them things. You had to feed them rascals every day. Didn't have automatic feeders back then. Had to feed them wheelbarrows. But didn't. Them chickens could eat more than I ever saw in my life reaching that wheelbarrow. And here, but here's a farmer. Here's a farmer that's a dairy farmer. Or one that prepares the soil. Most of the illustrations in the Bible is row crop farming. That is, they, they have to do the soil. You have to break up the soil. Ain't down coming in. I'm breaking up the soil, brother. It ain't down coming in. Not only that, I'm planting the seed. That's going out. Not only that, I'll have to wait on the rain. Then when the rain comes, i got to wait and wait and wait and wait until God sends a harvest. Folks, that's the way it is being a Christian. We might say, well, I visited so and so and they didn't get saved. Just God didn't send you over there to save nobody. God sent you over there to tell folks about Him. Saving is up, up to God. 
And that farmer, once he's done all that, there's no guarantee that he'll have a harvest. But you know what? I got a guarantee I'm going to have a harvest doing God's work because He promised me in His Word. There is a time in God's work, a time of plowing, time of planting, time of watering, cultivating, gathering. But now listen, as a time, you've got to work on your tractor. Now, first 11 years of my life, we use mutants. Now, I know most of you don't believe I can be that old. <laughs> but we started, you know, with my hand, right? <clears throat> when you took those collars off those mules and those harnesses off and that bridle off, you know what they'd do? They'd go out in the lot and they'd lay down on their back and they'd roll back and forth. Now, if you ain't never seen that, don't claim to be a coach. You know what they were doing? They were relaxing. They were doing what you and I as Christians need to do. I don't mean maybe we need to get out front of the church and wall around on our back. But what I mean is we need to relax. We need to what well, we need to just relax and get ready for another day, another day's work. Galatians said, and let us not be worried well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we Faint not. Do you see? When is that? When is that? It is when God says it is. It is when God says it is. It may not be at the end of the church year. may not be at the end of the calendar year. may not be at the, at the beginning of the church year. But I know one thing. At the end of the age, when Jesus comes back and raptures me up, I tell you, payday is coming. There's a lot of paydays that goes on right here. You know that? A lot of paydays goes on right here for our Christian life. For our, I think one of the greatest paydays there is for love for parents is to see their children saved. Amen. I mean, that is a payday, man. That is a payday. And it even gets better when you see your grandchildren saved. Man, that is payday, payday, payday. And God pays us in ways that we never, never, never thought that he would. It is too soon to quit. When you keep in mind the privilege that God gave you and me to serve Him, you keep in mind the harvest that's ahead. What is a harvest that's ahead? Well, when I go to be with the Lord, when I draw my last breath, I believe, as Paul said, boom, I'm in the presence of God right there. Right there. So here I am with God. The world may go on a thousand years. Well, it may go on 10,000 years. But then, the end time comes. And then everybody comes up. Those that are, are still alive, they're going to come up there. And then we'll receive our rewards done in the flesh. God promised us a harvest. Let me close with this. About 20 years ago, there came out a uh, survey about salespeople, people who sold. And it said that 48% of all salesmen quit after the first visit. 25% quit after the second visit. Only 15% made the third visit. And 80% of all sales and all money earned was done by 12% of those that were left. I said all that to say this. We're in an opportunity. We're in a state of privilege that we can work for God. We're in a good church. A good church. With plenty of opportunities, plenty of people to encourage you, plenty of older folks here that's been there and done that to help us grow in the Lord. But you know, in order to get to that point, there may be some of you here that, that's lost. That is, that is you as good as anybody else except you're lost. You never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know what it is to, to have Him as your personal Savior. Sometimes people claim Him as their Savior and they back up and they get in a backslidden situation. I'm more miserable than I was when they've lost. 
because they know what it was, the taste of the good word of the Lord, and then, and then go back on it. This morning we're going to sing an invitation as we get ready. If you're here today and you're not the will of God, I don't want you to leave here out of the will of God. Leave here in the will of God. If you're lost, leave here saved. If you saved and out of the Lord's will, you fix it this morning. Let's pray together. Bless the Lord God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. And we ask you, Lord, as we sing this invitation song, if there's anybody here today that's lost or that's backslid, anybody who's got a friend they need to pray for, God will love them that they're concerned about. It. God, I pray they come forward this morning. Express those concerns before you all. Boy, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.